Um, Brett Leslie uh, is going to talk with us about the U.S. Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board uh, and their recent report uh, and some of the implications of that for standards regarding shipment of spent nuclear fuel. Brett, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to provide some clarifications to your community on the Board's mission and two of its recent reports. I have copies of the reports and a fact sheet on the board mission back at the table near the exit sign. I'll be there during the break and I'll stay after the meeting as long as people have questions. Next slide. The Nuclear Waste Technical Re Review Board was established in 1987 as an independent agency. The law that established the board gave us the responsibility to evaluate the technical and scientific validity of the U.S. Department of Energy's Nuclear Waste Policy Act related activities. Our review includes DOE activities related to packaging or transportation of spent nuclear fuel and high-level waste and DOE's uh, disposal related activities. Next slide. The board's interest in the management of spent fuel at utility sites is limited solely to the impact this may have on operations that DOE may need to undertake after taking title to the spent nuclear fuel. And I want to move on to the latter part of the, the slide. Uh, the board's positions are found solely in our correspondence to Congress and DOE or in our reports. Statements like in a meeting like this are not positions of the board. Those are only in our reports. Next slide. I'd like to move on to the clarifications of the two reports. There have been two reports. That, um, both of them are back there. One, uh, the first top, uh, uh, report is on the management and disposal of U.S. Department of Energy spent nuclear fuel. That is not commercial spent nuclear fuel. That's not the fuel that's here at Songs. The, uh, the report covers the management and uh, disposal of the full range of the spent fuel managed by DOE. The report discussed the differences between the characteristics of the different types of the spent fuel managed by DOE. But importantly, that report in Appendix 2 has a comparison of DOE spent fuel and commercial spent nuclear fuel like that at Songs and describes the substantial differences between the two types. The report examined the technical issues related to DOE spent fuel packaging and storage that might affect its continued storage and transportation and disposal by DOE. So it's solely about DOE's fuel and DOE's activities. Next slide, please. Uh, I want to point out that there are quite a few types. In fact, over 250 types of uh, DOE, uh, Department of Energy spent nuclear fuel. And the findings and recommendations in that big, thick blue report are specific to the types of the DOE spent fuel that we identified. For example, during dry storage, we identified the potential accumulation of hydrogen gas relates to the dry storage of aluminum clad and aluminum based spent fuel, not commercial spent fuel or sodium bonded spent fuel. And three of the aluminum clad or aluminum based are highlighted to the right. Similarly, in that report, as we discuss packaging operations of DOE spent fuel, the board's monitoring and inspections recommendations relate to the DOE standardized canister that would be used for DOE spent fuel and not dual-purpose canisters used for storage of commercial uh, spent nuclear fuel. Now moving on to the second report. Next slide, please. More recently, in September, the board uh, published a report whose short title is Preparing for Nuclear Waste Transportation. And probably I should stop for a second and, and say the one word that I wish that was in the short version of the title is a nationwide transportation effort. So it's not looking at a single site. It's what DOE needs to look nationally. We evaluate, identified and evaluated the technical issues that need to be addressed by DOE in preparing a nationwide effort to transport spent nuclear fuel in high-level waste. The board analyzed two possible scenarios as a basis for our, our evaluation, but made no recommendations on whether if either of these two options is preferable. We analyzed a scenario where DOE accepts bare commercial spent nuclear fuel from nuclear utilities. This might occur for sites in the distant future that haven't packaged the fuel already into dual purpose canisters, so that is one option that DOE would have to be ready to, to deal with. We also analyzed the scenario where DOE accepts spent fuel assemblies prepackaged in canisters or casts like those now at Songs. 
Each scenario is, a possible, is, is possible when evaluating a nationwide transportation effort that includes all the waste at all the sites. And the scenarios are described in detail in appendix section A2 of that report. Next slide. The board did not suggest that repackaging of most spent nuclear fuel and dry storage would be required prior to removal from nuclear power plant sites. The report also includes discussion of DOE's analysis of transportation away from nuclear power plants in existing cask and canisters, canisters excuse me. and finally, the board recommended that for planning purposes, DOE should allow a minimum of, of, of a decade to develop new cask and canister designs for spent nuclear fuel and high-level waste management and storage and transportation. And I think it's important to, to stop for a second and say, DOE's solutions have to fit not just songs, but every other uh, facility. And so, the, uh, although there are only really two types, boiling water and pressurized water reactor, every reactor is different. There are different reactor lengths. So the cask has to fit all of those parts. And that's one of the reasons why the board said for planning purposes, 10 years. Um, it's important to recognize that DOE has pursued its own initiatives to, to develop multipurpose canisters that could assist its management and disposal of waste on a nationwide be basis and continues to conduct activities related to the direct disposal of dual purpose canisters like those at Songs. In fact, the board's next meeting will, will be on this specific topic. And thank you again for the opportunity to provide clerk clarifications on the board and its reports. Well, I really appreciate that, and thank you for accepting my invitation. So I have a couple questions about this, and maybe I could just start and um, help set the scene a little bit. Because there's this is among the many things you helped us understand is this is for DOE as a whole and the nation as a whole. And while the nation's great, we're very focused on San Onofre right now. So I want to understand the practical implications of this for San Onofre. First, could you help us understand the relationship between this board's activities and the site visits that DOE and other federal agencies are organizing on a regular basis. Um, the last one at Songs was, I think, about two years ago. They just finished one, I think, at Pilgrim. Is it Pilgrim? Right. Pilgrim. Uh, just in the right. last couple of days. So are those totally separate activities? So, so right. So the Department of Energy is the one who's doing the, doing the effort. Our report, the transportation report, identifies those activities. And, and basically, we made a recommendation to the to DOE to continue them, but to gather those lessons learned for all of the future uh, sites that are going to be decommissioned. So we review what DOE d does. We don't do the, okay. the evaluation. So the, my main question, and then I'll go to Ted Quinn, um, is you looked at these two different scenarios. One scenario is bare fuel, uh, which would need to be packaged in some way, and then fuel commercial fuel that is in canisters already. Correct. Now, starting 20 years ago or so, the Department of Energy and uh, with the support of EPRI and others and the entire industry moved in the direction, so this was after the last big piece of legislation, moved in the direction of the second scenario of these so-called multi-purpose canisters, the MPCs, and that's what we have at Song. So from the, from the vantage point of San Onofre, these two scenarios, although they exist theoretically, it's really only the second scenario where, where we're talking about moving uh, MPCs full of spent nuclear fuel. So here's my question, which is, what's the relevance of this last bullet point for that? Because the, the canisters have already been developed, the transport canisters have already been developed and licensed, and so I can appreciate there are scenarios at other sites, and also for the military-related fuel, where new canisters might need to be developed and it might take a decade. I completely understand that, but from the purposes of our site, is this last bullet point something we should be focused on or not? That's hard, hard, hard to, probably not. And, and the reason is that if you are, are to look at the entire length of nuclear power plants, we're probably only 50% through production of fuel. So that record. We're 100% we're, we're through. Well, you. you <laughs> no more fuel is going to be made. Right. But from an, again, our job is DOE nationwide. I understand. And so there may be a reason for DOE to develop a multi purpose canister. Now, uh, since you brought it up, under the standard contract, you know, that's going to have to have to be dealt with. And at some point, 
the Department of Energy is going to have to make a decision whether dual purpose canisters right. as they now exist will be acceptable for the entire program that leads to disposal. Yeah, so I really appreciate it. I just want to draw what I see as the implications of this out so we all understand it kind of clearly in plain English. First of all, I really appreciate the work you're doing nationwide. Um, second of all, one of the reasons that this is of keen interest to everybody here is we want to understand how we're ready if a strategic opportunity arises and one of these interim storage facilities is opened and certainly we're pushing as hard as we can. And so that's why we're so focused on what is the route for this fuel in these MPCs. And so it sounds like we've, we're all on the same page. And the last thing I think that's very important is that this panel and lots of other people have been figuring out what in existing law is problematic for us. And one of the things that's in existing law that's problematic for us is the standard contract. Marnie Magda in particular on this panel has done a lot of work there. And so we've helped to tee up some of those questions as, the, as legislation potentially moves through about which fuel has priority um, and also what the packaging requirements would be. And so I really appreciate your comment about the, the standard contract. Let me just see if there are any other comments about this uh, before we go to a break. Ted just Quinn? very quick, the first bullet caused a lot of confusion. Um, in the reading of the report, including in testimony, and I just, if you could ever uh, clarify it in, a, in any revisions you make, because it was not understood at all, okay. right? Okay. We do not need to repackage our fuel at San Onofre to move it, right? And until the standard contract is settled in the sense that both parties agree that the contract is modified, we document what the Department of Energy's position is in the report. Yeah. Okay, I appreciate that. And you know, the Department of Energy, since the contract is party and counterparty, the other party is the Department of Energy, and it was in fact the Department of Energy's guidance specifically on this issue to go to MPCs. And so I think my sense is that the whole industry is lined up around this, and that one of the things that needs to be done with these legislative initiatives is just make sure that's clarified notably through the standard contract. Jim Desmond, did you have a comment? Sorry to spend a little time think, in the weeds on this, but this is, no, these are important well, I, weeds. I, no. I think you answer, I think you just answered it. I was just curious if the canisters that we have now are compliant and could be moved uh, if, if a site opens up. That's a yes or a no. <laughs> no that, I don't know. Th this, this is, may not be... This is a question. No, please. This this is a question. It's a question for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission the, and and the the yeah. applicant. Right. It, 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 but but let me let me add something to this. So we we know the Department of Energy is working, doing a lot of things, looking at dual purpose canisters. They've developed the Atlas rail car, that would handle all of those types of existing canister systems. The the design for that rail car is in the public domain. If Songs wanted to use it, they'd actually have to buy, build and buy it. But they couldn't use what DOE has already already developed. Yeah. And we've just, just to, to complete the record here, we've had periodic updates on the Atlas rail car testing program. Uh, before we go to a just, break, I want to... Can I have a quick, quick little follow-up? Could you remind me, again, I guess, the anticipated lifespan of the canisters that we have? So I want to go to Doug, and maybe you can answer that question and any other comment you have about this, and then I want to say a couple things before we go to break. Doug? Sure. Uh, the design life of a, a multi-purpose canister such as ours is 60 years. The service life would typically be 100 years or more. And along with that goes the NRC licensing requirements that requires an aging management program or plan that we submit to the commission at the 20-year point for a relicensing process. So there's pretty good controls around the canister itself and the storage systems. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other comments about this, Doug, or can I go I just break? want to comment about the DOE work and, and how the industry moved in this direction. I think back when Secretary Watkins took over as Secretary of Energy, he sponsored a study through EPRI uh, to study the best system to store and ultimately move fuel at all the nuclear stations in the country. It turned out to be the multi-purpose cancer system. A contract was awarded to Westinghouse to do that. Um, and then after Westinghouse, other vendors came into the picture licensed their cancer systems, their shipping systems, including shipping casks, uh, through the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So essentially, we're poised and ready. When you look back at the standard contract, it's important to understand it was developed back as part, right after the Waste Policy Act, 
and it was built for actually in the anticipation of moving fuel from wet fuel pools in wet storage to a repository location. And then along came the need for a good storage system. So a decade later, the development of the canister system. So that's kind of how we got here. And it's true that the verbiage in the standard contract will need to be adjusted at some point. But it's also true that it's not a yes or no answer to your question. So um, I want to thank you very much, Brett. I want to just point out that there's more pizza. There's water of various shapes and sizes. The information booths are open, and we are going to take a five-minute break, and then we're going to go to public comment. That's why we're here. Yeah.